So, this is the last bit in Matthew 24 about the road to tribulation. So, in the previous videos, we had kind of laid, done some a bit of groundwork in in uh, in Daniel, looking at the timeline and how that that timeline is not continuous or contiguous, but there's a gap in between where God squeezes in the church, and that gap is so far close to 2,000 years. Personally, I think that gap is nearing an end. There's several reasons for that. On the one hand, I believe that gap is not going to last more than 2,000 years. Just saying, just my personal perspective. I'm not saying I have a, re a big reason for that other than what Peter said about a day with the Lord being as a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years as a day and looking at how that um, our history as, as, as a human race starting from Genesis 1 appears to follow the same pattern as the six days of creation and the final Sabbath day of rest. We're going to have a Sabbath 1,000 years. I think we follow that model, but I have no empirical reasons for that. So this is me just speculating. Please do not assume I'm trying to create a doctrine out of this. I genuinely think our time is nearly done, especially as I see the events unfolding, but I could be wrong. You know, the age of the church could last not 1,000 years. Quite frankly, I doubt it. Um, it could last not a few years. It could last not a few months. Quite frankly, personally, I genuinely believe we could be out of here before this video is done. We could be out of here before you finish watching this video. We could be out of here before next week is done. I don't know when. The point is, I think our time here is very, very short. So we need to do as much as we can, warn as many as we can, as quickly and as 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 um, with as much gravity and as much seriousness and integrity as we can before we are taken out of here. Because once we are taken out of here, it's not going to be pleasant for those who are left behind. Okay? Now, so I, I wanted to very quickly deal with the remaining verses of Matthew 24. And the, the remaining verses of Matthew 24 start set the tone or set the stage for the verses of Matthew chapter 25, especially when it starts to talk about the various parables that uh, are with respect to the kingdom, and in particular, the parable of the um, the parable of the ten virgins, which, which many people assume <laughs> is again, they, many people make the assumption that that's the rapture, and it's talking about believers being the ten virgins and so on. And unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, that's not true. Um, and I'll, I'll treat that. That's not what I'm, I want to talk about now. What I want to talk about now is is very, actually very simple, straightforward, but it doesn't mean it's easy. What I mean by it's easy, I'm talking about it's obedience. Because the thing about the Word of God is that it's not sufficient to hear it. It's not sufficient to understand it. It is important that we adhere to it. We comply with it. We obey it. Because when we obey, the Bible says we then we are no longer forgetful hearers who look at themselves in the mirror and walk away immediately forgetting what manner of men we are according to james chapter one i believe right but that would become doers of the work that's the whole point of all this all this is pointless if all you do is keep it here if it's not reflecting itself in your conduct if it's not reflecting yourself in a sense of urgency if it's not reflecting itself in a sense of pre preparedness then it would have been entirely pointless now in verse 45 of Matthew 24, Jesus says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. In other words, Jesus wants that when he comes back, and by extension, when the rapture takes place as well, you are found doing what you were asked to do. He says, Verily I say unto you, verse 47, that he shall make him ruler over all his house, or over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, like people are doing today, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of. Now, this is not very different from what happened with the Jews when Jesus Christ came the first time. 
because they had not taken the word of God seriously, because they had not looked at the prophecies in Jeremiah, in Daniel, in Isaiah, and taken the scripture seriously, they did not recognize his coming the first time. Which is interesting when you consider that the wise men, and again, like I said, I was speculating, I think it was I've been in the second or third video, I speculated about the wise men who came from the east, that they must have come from Babylon, and they must have followed the school of thinking and teaching of Daniel, recognized the signs, and traced where Jesus was going to turn up. Daniel must have trained these guys very well because the Bible tells us that they followed the sign. They followed the sign of the star and, and, and traced it all the way. And I suspect that Daniel had shown them quite a number of things, including his prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to, 20, to 27. He had shown them things in Isaiah. He had shown them timelines and so on. And so they could kind of have a hint of their kind of time when Jesus would have been turning up. That's apart from the Holy Spirit guiding them as well. Again, this is just speculation on my part. All I'm simply trying to say is that these guys paid attention. The wise men paid attention. The Jews, on the other hand, back in those days, did not pay attention. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm better than them because I've said this and openly confessed this before. Chances are that I would have also missed them because when you read in the Old Testament, when you read about the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah in the Old Testament, you don't immediately get a sense of two visitations. You get the impression it's coming one time. It's not immediately obvious to the undiscerning that there are two visitations, not one. You know, and which is the reason why when they saw certain characteristics of his, they did not recognize him as the Messiah, and so they took him for granted. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Don't do that. Don't make that same mistake. He says in verse 48, but if, but, but, and if that servant, that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him. This is why it is important to be on the lookout. Be expectant. Be continuously in, the, in a sense of urgent expectation of the Lord. Now, I know that, unfortunately, that sometimes can also give rise to a feeling of despair, especially when people start going on about high watch times. Now, I'm not saying don't watch, because I do watch. But I'll be honest with you. I'm not a great fan of that phrase, high watch time. Why? Because it almost gives the impression that you should be watchful during this period. And th these other times, now nah, we can kind of relax a bit. When, it's, when a feast is on the horizon, like the Feast of Trumpets, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of um, or, or, or Yom Kippur, or the Feast of Passover, high watch time, or a particular date, high watch time. And then the problem is, sometimes those high watch times, when they come and go, apart from it making the person look like he doesn't know what he's talking about, and they may know what they're talking about, but apart from it not making them look like they know what they're talking about. He also leaves other people with a sense of despair. Like, Lord, when are you coming? And I feel it too, because even though I'm not one for high watch times and all that stuff, I'm perpetually in a state of waiting, eagerly anticipating, hearing my name or hearing that trumpet or hearing the combination of the two and then hearing the words, come up hither and then we're gone. But in the meantime, where every day I see this world getting worse and worse and... I'm still here. I am in a state of, Lord, when? Lord, when? And so I feel the same sense of despair that everybody else feels. But it is better to have that sense of despair of, Lord, when are you coming? Lord, we are so desperate for you to come. Lord, we, eager, we are eager to see you come. Than the one who says, yeah, I think it'll be here in 10 years time. Nah, I think it'll be here in 15 years time. Kicking that can down the road of thinking, oh, the Lord will, call, the Lord is delaying his coming. It's not coming soon. It's not coming soon. It's not coming in my lifetime. I'm going to be an old man before he comes and so on. What they fail to realize is this. The Bible tells us that in verse 50, it says, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. 
The Bible describes it as being like a th- the day. He says it describes his coming as being like a thief in the night. A thief in the night. Friends, be ready because our time is nearly done here. I know sometimes it means that you'll be, you occasionally have feelings of despair because it hasn't happened as quickly as you want. Somebody once said something, he said, it is the hope that kills you. So another person says, don't give me hope. It is the hope that kills you. Friends, I want you to have hope. I want you to realize this. Our blessed hope, according to Titus 2.13, is going to happen. It's a question of when, not if. I'll stop here. Take care of yourselves. This marks the end of our conversation about Matthew 24. Any other conversation about Matthew 24 will probably happen in the comment section. Take care. God bless you. Thank you. Bye.